The common things of life can oftentimes be a great help to us in understanding spiritual realities. Paul spoke of being like a nursing mother in his care for the Thessalonians. He also spoke about being like a father in his exhorting them. As well, there are some realities that you all experienced today, which will help us as we come to the word of God today. You all woke up. That'll be notable a little bit later. You all got dressed. Those realities, I hope, after today's message, will have even greater significance in your daily routine. We come to our sixth message in our study of the seventh commandment. We've seen its basic meaning. We've looked at reasons for protecting marital intimacy. We've seen the specific violations of the seventh commandment. And there were some directives given for avoiding impurity and maintaining purity, which I began to look at last week. These sins, I'll repeat what I said then, are so potent and the temptations so ubiquitous, the enemies so subtle, deceptive, cunning, and persevering, that I plan to give a variety of means and methods for avoiding impurity and maintaining purity rather than just give a detailed exposition or explanation of various texts, though this morning we'll be looking at a couple of texts. And in looking at those directives for avoiding impurity and maintaining purity, we saw first of all that there must be a fear of God. We must develop a broader fuller, more balanced understanding of the nature of God. We must develop a deeper impression of the filthiness and evilness of sin and God's just abhorrence of and wrath against sin. Now I made a comment on Proverbs 6 and verse 16. There we read that there are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. And I mentioned that this passage goes on to describe how God hates not only the sin committed by the sinner, but the sinner himself. I didn't make direct application to ourselves, but here's the direct application that comes out of such an understanding of that text. It's not just our sins that God hates. As we think of our own sin, let us realize that when we commit these sins, we are not just committing sinful behavior that is offensive to God. We are making ourselves offensive to God. And so it's not just that we can say, oh, I, I, I ran a stop sign, and that wasn't a good thing. It's we ran a stop sign, and we ran over the son of the police officer who pulled us over. We have offended God, broken his law, and made ourselves, in some sense, offensive to our God. And so that's how we need to view ourselves in light of the way that God views sinners and their sin. Now I know that doesn't change the fact that we're children of God. That doesn't mean that we're cast off. We look at it in the context of the father looking at a child. I understand all that, but I wanted to make that clarification and application. The third thing that we saw with regard to the fear of God was we must grow in our appreciation and knowledge of the length, breadth, and depth of God's law as that which describes a life which is pleasing to God and thereby be diligent in our adherence to that law. That was the first of the directives. We need to fear God and keep his commandments. The second was we need to mature in faithfulness. The third was we need to master 
ourselves. The fourth, be careful about your companions. And the last, be careful about your entertainments. This morning I take up with capital letter F under my outline. That's number six in the various directives for avoiding impurity and maintaining purity. And I'm just going to have a little acronym here. All of you parents, please be patient with me. The children, I'm sure, will, will appreciate this and I think get a handle on this, but I believe it's a handle that can help all of us. But I wrote this specifically thinking of the feeble-minded among us in the sense of those who need these kind of mnemonics, meaning me. Make a plan. And the mnemonic is this, be brave, B-R-A-V-E, be brave. The first thing that we need to do in avoiding impurity and maintaining purity is believe. Believe the truth about these sins. Believe what the Bible teaches. Believe that our enemies are powerful. Believe that we have a lying heart. There is a cunning devil. And there is a very enticing world. Believe that these temptations are potent because they are rooted or, or attached to a gift of God which is so good and so pleasurable and so satisfying. Believe those things. Believe that the consequences are devastating. Marriages are broken. Children are scarred. It reduces a man to a crust of bread. The way to her house leads to the grave. Believe these things. Believe as well in the grace of God. Believe what the Bible says about the abundance of the grace of God, about the power of the grace of God, about the grace of God which abounds to sinners in Jesus Christ. And where sin abounds, and brethren, in this area, sin abounds. Grace superabounds. Believe. The second is R. Recognize. Recognize the dress, the look, the talk, and the places. That is, recognize the bait, the hook, and the trap. Recognize those things in our society, in our lives, in those around us, where there is a particular trap for you. The particular place where you are most tempted. The particular persons around whom you have the greatest difficulty. Recognize those things. And then that takes, takes us directly to A in our acronym. Believe the truth about these things. Recognize these, the bait, the hook, and the trap. And avoid. Avoid them. Don't go near her house. Don't go down that way. Don't be alone in that, at that time. Don't sit by yourself or be with that person in that particular setting. Don't be alone with him or her in particular where there's possibility of temptation. Avoid all the occasions, circumstances, and companions that lead to temptation. And part of avoidance is protection. Protect yourself. Avoid some of those temptations by protecting yourself. And in particular, get a filter on your computer. Have accountability with others. The best way to keep yourself unstained by the world or to clean yourself from stain in the world, let me put it this way, the best way to clean yourself from the stain of the world is to not get stained. And so avoid by protection, by fleeing. We'll come to that 
The next is V, believe, recognize, avoid, and vanquish. This is my hardest word to get one for, vanquish. Aim at nothing less than complete conquest by the grace of God over these sins. Fight the good fight of faith. Mortify the deeds of the flesh. It doesn't just say set them aside and watch over them. It says kill them, vanquish them, put them to death. And to accomplish that, God has given us his word. How shall a young man keep his way pure? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Psalm 119 and verse 9. He has given us his worship, private, corporate, and family, to enable us and to empower us, to strengthen us, to guide us in vanquishing, in putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Prayer. Private and corporate, calling upon God together, drawing near unto God that he might draw near unto us. And the brethren who know you, you could be a means of grace. These are some of the means of grace that God has given for purifying us and for keeping us. He's given us close friends, family, and especially parents. For you young people, God has given us his spirit who works in and by these means in us. So we must make use of any legitimate means. As one man reminded me of Pastor Chansky's words, marshal every means. That God has put at our disposal to obtain grace and to fight against and flee from these temptations. Believe all that the Bible has to say about this. Recognize the, the traps, the hook, the bait. Avoid those circumstances, situations, people. Vanquish these sins and then escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there has no temptation taken you but such as is common to man but God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18, flee immorality. 2 Timothy 2.22, now flee from youthful lusts. And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. So be brave, believe, recognize, avoid, vanquish, and escape. You see, a lot of times we take out our sword and what we really ought to be doing is putting on our running shoes. We think we can fight when in fact the devil is too powerful. We need to just run. But sometimes we have to fight. And we must always be vanquishing the remaining sin of our hearts and putting to death the deeds of the body. But now that brings me to what is, in essence, two mini sermons. Two capstone passages. As I've been studying this and as I've gone through this, there are two passages that I want to put into your arsenal in combating and addressing these sins of sexual impurity. Two large guns, if you will. Two passages that I believe are capable of being memorized, that they might be in the mind to keep us pure, to guide our steps, to help us in our battle and in our fleeing from these sins. The first is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Please turn there with me, if you will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. There are many other passages. I don't want to turn this into a... Uh, lifetime study, but I do want to try to hit these two passages this morning, and Lord willing, leave them with you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Finally then, brethren, and again I'm reading from the New American Standard Edition, the scriptures, finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that as you received from us instruction as 
to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no man transgress and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as he also, we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impu impurity, but in sanctification. Consequently, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, as you hear these words, and as I seek to unpack these words in part and seek to bring some, some uh, summary exhortations and summary applications from this text, I want you to hear this text in the context in which it's given. Remember, Paul is a nursing mother to the Thessalonians. He has taken these Thessalonians and by the grace of God has been an instrument in seeing them converted, seeing them joined to the church. And he's like the one who nursed them and cared for them and watched over them and that's how he thinks of them. If they fall, he crumbles. If they stand, he's encouraged. He's like a father. A loving father over these who are facing many difficulties in life, who are new in their walk, and as a godly father, he is seeking to give them instruction that they might be able to walk and stand and persevere. He's like a mother and a father to these Thessalonians. Now, you all know what mothers and fathers are like. And think of the best times that you've had with your mother or your father when they have spoken to you some instruction or some warning. And it came with all of that appropriate love and, and you felt it and you heard it and you said, yeah, I can receive that from mom. I can receive that from dad because it's easy for me to do. Now, you ought to always do it, even when they don't come across that way or you don't perceive it that way. But that's the context in which these things are spoken. And that's the context in which I stand here to proclaim them to you. I don't want to speak about these things anymore. But I have to. That you might stand. That we might stand. And so listen here as Paul begins in this passage by giving a repeated request and requirement. In verses 1 and 2, he repeats a request. He says, brethren, I'm giving a request and I exhort you as you received from us before. Received from us instruction. He says, I've talked about these things before. I'm giving you this request, this exhortation again. The bottom line exhortation here is this, excel in obedience. I'm telling you again, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Ever heard those words? I heard those words growing up almost daily. Paul is saying, I'm going to repeat it because you need it. I'm going to repeat the exhortations. I'm going to repeat the request, the pleas. To excel. To keep pressing on in obedience. And the authority with which I do this is in Christ Jesus. The authority with which I do this, verse 3, this is the will of God. I stand here to tell you what Jesus wants you to do and what God wants you to do. At the same time, in giving this exhortation and this request, in Jesus, I'm telling you that I'm doing this as one who stands with you in fellowship. I love you as a fellow believer. And by telling you this is in Christ Jesus, Paul is saying that here is where you find then the vitality and power to fulfill this request and this requirement. Because I want you to excel in obedience. Why? Because I want you to keep walking 
and I want you to please God. Notice how he says it in verse 1. We request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, that you may excel still more. He says, I'm telling you this because I want you to be pleasing to God. I want you to continue walking. And I want you to find the pleasure of God, the smile of God coming down upon you. There's the fear of God coming through there. You see that? But all this comes along the lines of commandments. He's not pulling any punches. He's not just, he's not trying to woo them. He says, these are commandments. You know what commandments we gave you. This is authoritative. My friends, there's one brief application that I bring right here at this point in time, and that is however far along you are in the Christian life, however much progress you have made in the battle against these sins, or however old you might be in the circumstances of your life where these things may not be a temptation to you as they are to some of the rest of us, the fact of the matter is you still need to press on. You still need to excel more and more. Don't quit. Don't coast. That's Paul's words to all of us today. So there's his repeated request and requirement. The second thing we see in this passage is Paul's specific concern. And he starts in, the gen in general, then boils it down. His general concern is this, their sanctification. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. I want you to be holy. I want you to be God-like. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification. God chose you to be saved through sanctification. Sanctification is essential to our ultimate salvation. Sanctification is part of the reason why they were chosen. And so Paul writes to the Ephesians and says, You have been chosen before the foundation of the world. Why? That you should be holy and blameless. He says, I'm concerned about you being holy, godlike in your character. This is a vital trait of every child of God. Then having given it in general context of the, the area of sanctification and becoming holy, he narrows it down. He narrows it down to his specific concern and he gives it to us in three clauses. Notice there's, in the New American Standard, it uses the word that three times. That. Verse 3, you abstain from sexual immorality. Verse 4, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel. And, verse, and then verse 6, that no man transgress and defraud. Here's the specific thing. Your sanctification, I'm specifically focusing on this. You Thessalonians and the commentators say this was a, a rampant problem in Rome. Rome just furthered a lot of the Greek philosophy and a lot of the same sins just spread throughout the Roman Empire. This is the kind of thing that they were facing. And so he says, here's the sanctification I'm aiming at right now, that you abstain from sin, the sin, particularly sexual immorality. Now I've already told you what all those sins are, so the first thing he says is abstain from sin. The second thing he says is maintain yourself or obtain a wife. Notice verse 4. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, I always took that means self-control. He possesses himself and he controls himself and masters himself. The more I studied, I found a lot of people say that this actually says to obtain a wife. Now, I'm not going to go into whether which one it is. I think it, it fits for both. It really does. But the fact of the matter is the word possess literally means to acquire. So acquire a vessel. You don't acquire a body because you, you, get, you get that at birth. But you do acquire a wife or you do acquire a husband. And 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Husbands, 
live with your wives in an understanding way as with a weaker vessel, same Greek and English word. But the important thing here is he says, whether it's, whether it's mastering yourself or whether it's how you get, get and maintain your relationship with your spouse, he says this is to be done in the context of sanctification and honor. You're to do this, you are to treat your bodies as the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are to treat that spouse of yours as more important than yourselves, as one for whom Christ died. We are to treat our bodies and those of the opposite sex as though they had been set apart, sanctified unto God. This is the context in which we're supposed to relate. These are things set apart unto God in sanctification and in honor. That is, as worthy of praise and respect, not in lustful passions, not in those passionate appetites within our hearts, acting like the Gentiles. And in this case, Paul is saying that to indicate you're acting like those, he goes on to say, who know not God. He says, don't live your life in this area, whether you, it's caring for your body or caring for your spouse. Don't act like the world all around you and just give yourself to whatever bubbles up in your heart. Disney got it wrong. Don't listen to your heart. Don't follow your heart. Your heart is deceptive above all else and will leave you astray. Believe what all the Bible says about your heart. Believe it. But if we are to maintain sexual purity, then we must not only abstain from sin, we must master ourselves and we must use the appropriate means. And if you're married, that means take Care how you deal with your spouse. The third thing that Paul says in giving the specific exhortations about their sanctification, not only abstain from sin, maintain yourself, or obtain a wife, but refrain from fracturing behavior. Verse 6. That no man transgress and defraud his brother. This sin, these sins, are sins of betrayal and treason. I understand that upstate New York, there's a statue to um, one man by the name of Arnold, Benedict Arnold. And he won, he was instrumental in winning a great battle there. But all that's left is his boot. They didn't want to give anything of credit to a man who proved to be a traitor. Paul says, when you think about these sins, you need to see them as treasonous, as matters of betrayal. They are transgressions against brethren. They defraud brothers. Now that word brothers, he may be referring to the man or woman with whom you engage in that sinful activity. He may also be speaking of the spouse of the person you're going to be engaging with that sinful behavior. You are now affecting their spouse. He may be speaking about the parents of a daughter, the parents of a son who are caught and involved in such sinful behavior, their lives are going to be affected. He may be thinking about the family members, the children, the extended family that are all affected when these kinds of sins and come into the relationship. You're not just sinning against one person. You're transgressing against the brethren. You're affecting many. You may be leaving scars that some man or woman will have to deal with who eventually becomes the husband or wife of that one with whom you sinned. He says, here's what I'm thinking of when I say your sanctification, that you abstain from sin, 
that you obtain a wife or maintain your body or both, and that you refrain from fracturing many lives. Well, that's Paul's repeated request and requirement and his specific concerns. Now, the point that really captures my heart and the thing I want to drive home to you is his sober reminder. His sober reminder. He says at the end of verse 6, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things. Just as you were told, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. This little church heard an awful lot as a, as a baby church. And one of the things they heard was warnings about how God looks at these kinds of sins. And they warned them, and now he repeats it in the letter. God is the avenger. Now, the avenger is the same word that's used of the civil magistrate in Romans chapter 13 and verse 4. They bear the sword for this purpose that they might avenge. For it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Those are fearful words. Do you believe those words? Those words actually have any impact upon your heart and mind as you think of these things and this seventh commandment? Well, I've been spending so much time on this. My friend, I don't want God to be an avenger toward you. I don't want you to set yourself at, at a posture where God is an adversary against you. When God sets himself against his enemies, it's painful. And even when God deals with his own children in chastisement, it can be devastating. That's what Paul warns him. He says, he says don't do these things. Because this is the way God might respond. You think you got away with it. God is gracious and long-suffering, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Blessed be God, or none of us would have been here. We would have all perished with Adam. But here's the sober reminder. But Paul doesn't stop there. After giving this sober reminder, he then goes on to give some encouraging reinforcements. He's already told us that you were, he, goes, he tells us that you are called. Look at verse 7. God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Now that can be written in a negative light. God didn't call you to, be, to be give yourself to sin. But stop and think about it, what he just said. He said, God has called you. God, by the Spirit, has exercised that amazing grace and called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, and has drawn you to himself. And in doing that, he's drawn you to himself that you might be like him. Not that you might keep on in your sin. Not that you might keep running in the paths you've run in before, but that you might be holy in sanctification. But look at this. God says, Paul says, look at this. You've been called by God. And that's, Paul's language for the effectual work of the Holy Spirit in the life of dead sinners, giving them new life, and drawing them to God that they might repent and believe and be saved. He says, that's what's behind all this. Look at your calling. Remember, you were called. And he goes on and he says this, consequently, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God. Now notice that. When you choose these sins, and if you refuse to accept Paul's teaching, Paul says, you are rejecting God. Here's your choice. 
And at the moment, even for the child of God, at that moment when we give in to that temptation, we're turning our backs away from God and rejecting God. And frankly, brethren, isn't it often true that when those temptations come and we fall into those sins, we don't even think about God. It's like, where did, why did all God all of a sudden vanish from my thinking? But he says, you're rejecting God. You're turning away from that life-giving spring to hew out for yourself cisterns that are broken and from which you can get nothing. He says, you're rejecting God. But then notice the God you're rejecting is the God who gives the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to capture that. Here's what he's saying. He's given you his Holy Spirit. This sanctifying work is not something you have to do by your own power. You've got the spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, working these things in you. This is the God that you're rejecting, the one who has given you the Holy Spirit. And he gives the Spirit to all of his people. One commentator put it this way. To live sinfully in this impure way, I'm taking a big word and make, trying to make it simple. To live sinfully in, in this impurity while receiving the gift, that is the gift of the Holy Spirit, is grossly insulting to the giver. He says, I'm giving you my spirit and yet you're going to reject me and go. He says, that's, that's incredibly insulting to God. Paul said, do you not know that your body, speaking of the individual Christian, is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Christians can fall in these sins too. But you've got the Spirit of God working within you to stir up your conscience. And when your conscience is stirred up by the Spirit of God, then you go to the fountain that is open for sin and uncleanness, and you flee in the power of the Spirit from those sins, and you seek by the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body that you might live. Now, I just want to draw out several applications here, various motives drawn from this passage. I just, want to, I just want to smack, as it were, I just want to throw out various motives from this passage. Avoid sexual impurity because it is your duty before God. It is your duty to the Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord. Commandments are in the Lord. Avoid sexual impurity. Maintain sexual purity because it is pleasing to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Is it not your desire, dear child of God, to know the smile of your father? Is that not sweetness to you to know him looking down upon you and to enjoy that blessing of purity of heart that you can see, as it were, by the eyes of faith? The face of God? Then avoid these sins. This is pleasing to God. Brings the smile of God. Avoid these sins because it's an honorable way to live. Possessing our vessel in honor and sanctification. It is an honorable way to live before God and among men. And because it's part of our sanctification, our maintaining our purity. is partly how we reflect the character of God. This is Paul, the gentle father, exhorting his children. Avoid these things for these reasons. And when you commit these things, remember, you're committing betrayal and treason. And remember, it rouses the anger of God. Remember, It moves God to take up his adversarial role. But then remember, by way of motivation, this is not an impossible battle. Brethren, it's not impossible. 
We may have to fight till the day we die. We may have to fight until we cross the river. We may have to fight until Jesus Christ himself appears. But fight we can. Because the power of God has already been exercised toward us in eternity past. He put his love upon us and chose us that we might be holy. And in time, he sent his spirit to work within us and give us life and call us unto sanctification. And Jesus Christ died that we might be set free from these sins and be forgiven of these sins. We must be holy. It is essential to our ultimate and final salvation. We must strive to be sanctified and pure in these areas, but this is what God has already done. And then beyond that, He's given us His Spirit to dwell within us. Oh, I can't win! You can win, my brother. You can win, my sister. Because God fights for you. The Spirit dwells within you. Don't give up. And if you're tempted to give up, go back to these things. Confess your sin. Go back to these things and rest solely and wholeheartedly upon these realities. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God. Fight the good fight of faith and by the Spirit Put to death the deeds of the body. Now, in light of some of the things that came out of this passage, there's just a couple of applications that I kept cutting and pasting them in my computer, and I didn't know where else to. I'm going to put them here. All right? So if it doesn't quite fit, I'm sorry, but they attach my mind to the things that we saw about obtaining a vessel or maintaining a vessel. Obtaining a vessel. If you have obtained, by the grace of God, the gift of a spouse. Then here is my exhortation to you, my summary exhortation to you with regard to the seventh commandment and with regard to your relationship and the marriage bed. I urge you to faithfully love. Faithfully love. By love I mean every aspect of the one flesh relationship, every aspect of communion with another, faithfully love and freely enjoy one another. That's what we learn in Song of Solomon. That's what we learn in Proverbs chapter 5. One of the means to maintaining your purity and avoiding impurity. Faithfully love and freely enjoy one another. If you're single, you say, well, you know, I appreciate all that's being said about the temptations, but you're single and you're not, you don't have that vessel. You don't have that means for giving vent to those passions and desires. Then I urge you, contentedly wait and enter, energetically restrain yourself. Contentedly wait. Waiting for the Lord is not passivity. But wait for the Lord to act on your behalf and wait upon the Lord to act on your behalf. That is, embrace his sovereign will and pray, pouring out your desires to God. Do it contentedly. Learn contentment, like the Apostle Paul had to learn it. And he didn't learn it because he had it all. Because he learned it also by not having it. He learned in whatsoever circumstances he was in to be content. Embrace your heavenly Father's gracious will for you. Submit to his sovereign timing. But let me tell you that sincere contentment does not preclude earnest prayer. Just because you're content doesn't mean you don't pray about it. Don't pray about it earnestly. Pray earnestly! for a spouse, and wait for God. But earnest prayer does not permit discontentment. 
And I've been earnestly praying for this, and it hasn't come yet. Oh, I'm going to grumble and complain. No, 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 no. If you're earnestly praying, then you're putting at God's feet, then you leave it there, and you go away like Hannah her face was changed, and she went away and ate, and you go away contented in what God has given you. Contentedly wait, but then energetically restrain. Energetically. That is, exercise self-control. And by the word energetically, I mean this. With all your might, with all your heart. I almost put the word cheerfully in there. With all your might... And with all your heart, restrain yourself and redirect your energies. Listen to what another commentator said. Christian singles, alongside a natural loneliness, accompanied sometimes by acute pain, we find joyful self-fulfillment in the self-giving service of God and other people. So energetically, Restrain yourself, and that doesn't mean just spend all your energies on you, but redirect those energies to serving others. Find your place among the people of God or in your family where you can serve to the glory of God. Well, that's my first passage, 1 Thessalonians 4. More briefly, the last passage, Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Verses 11 to 14. Paul writes to the Romans, And this do, that is, love or, or fulfill all these commandments that he's been setting out up to this point, this do, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. This is a very relevant passage. Paul is addressing Christians. He's talking about Christian love. He's talking about those who have already believed. This is an important passage. Paul is addressing besetting sins of that culture, which are besetting sins of this culture. Carousing, drunkenness, sexual promiscuity, sensuality, strife, and jealousy. It's a relevant passage. And it's a timely passage. It comes just at the right time. Paul says it's time to act. And he uses the illustration that I began with, it's time to wake up. He uses a common cultural phenomenon. The sun comes up and you get up. There is time, it is time to wake up because Verse 13, morning is coming, nighttime is ending, daytime is imminent. Again, this is an illustration from their culture. The lazy person, when the sun came up, he would sleep on as the sun came up. But the diligent person, when the sun came up, he got up. And when the sun went down, he went to bed. There weren't the lights, oftentimes, like we have today. They didn't have the availability. So they got up with the sun. So at the very least, he's saying, don't be a sluggard in these matters. Be diligent in these matters. Wake up. Get going. Dawn has come. It's about to come. Night's almost past. But there's more than just an illustration from life. There's a figure here of God's timing. The day spoken of here is the day of the Lord. The day that is about to come, the day that is imminent, that Paul sees, is the day of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, your salvation is nearer. Your ultimate, full salvation, which will be free from all these sins, is nearer. Christ is about to come than when you first believed. The night spoken of here, I believe, is the night of this present evil age. As 
as he writes to the Galatians, that he might deliver us out of this present evil age. In other words, now is the time to wake up because Christ's coming is imminent. Now, take this together with Romans 12, 1 and 2. Look back at Romans 12, 1 and 2, which he begins this passage, this part of his exhortations. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Here, he says, look back at all that God has done for you in Christ, and therefore live in light of what Christ has done. Now he's saying, look forward to what God is going to do in Christ when Christ returns and live as you're, what you're going to be when he comes. So it's timely because Christ is a, Christ's coming is imminent. It's on the horizon. And then it's very practical. It's full of exhortations. And I haven't got time. Let me just highlight them for you. He says in verse 12b, work and put on your armor. Work in warfare. Your work, put off the dark deeds. Stop acting in that way. And then put on your armor, the armor of light, that you may fight against these deeds of darkness. Verse 13, walk. Walk as in the light. Walk as those who are visible for everyone to see. Walk as though you're walking in the light of God and he's looking right down upon you and it's all wide open. Walk in the light of that great day when Christ will return and he will be the light of every day. Stop walking in the paths of darkness. And then verse 14, where? Work, walk, and wear. You all woke up this morning. The next time you wake up, I want you to hear the, Paul, the Apostle Paul's words and says it's time to wake up. Fight against these sins. It's time to wake up and walk in the path of righteousness that Christ has laid out for you and no longer in the deeds of darkness. Wake up! And every morning when you wake up, I hope this passage will ring in your ears and be part of God's means to set you on a path to serve Him. But then wake up and put on your clothes. Get ready for the day. Now I can't even begin to unpack it. Pastor Martin couldn't even begin to unpack it. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? He doesn't say imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. He says put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he doesn't just say put on Jesus. He says put on the full name, the Lord, the Master, Jesus, the Savior, Christ, the fulfillment of all of God's redemptive promises and purposes. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. About the best I could do is, is to put it in this way. Just like you put on a garment and, and whatever garment you're wearing, that's what everybody sees. And you see, when I put on one of my orange shirts, which some of my fellow elders think are garish, but I happen to like, and I put on one of my orange shirts, you see, what do you see when you look at me? Orange shirt. And that's what I look like. I'm wearing my orange shirt. Well, you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is you go forth as a little Christ. You go forth as a little Jesus. You go forth as one who is under the Lordship of Christ. And everybody who looks at you says, he has been with Jesus. And everyone who looks at you says, that's how Jesus must have acted. You put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you display in a vital, vibrant way to all around you. I am under his lordship. He has saved me by his blood from my sins. And he is the fulfillment of every promise. And he is my hope forever. And that's what people see. When you get up in the morning and you are looking in your closet, what am I going to wear today? You never, you always have at least one answer for that question. You look in your closet and you say, you know what, whatever I put on today, I want to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want everybody to know when they look at me, I'm under his lordship, he's saved me, and he's my hope and the fulfillment of all the promises. That's what I want them to see. And when you're picking that tie out, that Sunday morning tie, or you're putting that dress on, or you're getting ready to go out in the garment, garden, this is a garment you can wear to the garden party and to go out gardening. 
This is a garment you can wear if you're 80 years old, 90 years old, 100 years old, or 4 years old, 3 years old, 2 years old in Christ. You can put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is a garment one size does fit all. It's all the righteousness you need. And you see, he's not talking about salvation here. He's talking about living the Christian life. So it's not put on the righteous robes of Christ in justification. It's living the godly, Christ-like life in sanctification that he's aiming at here. It begins with believing upon him and being, having imputed righteousness. That's where it begins. But it goes beyond that on a daily basis. Wake up. Walk and fight and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's another part to that. You see, you can love Christ and study Christ and meditate on Christ and think about Christ all you want. But if you're making provision for the flesh, if you're leaving room for sin, if you're not mortifying the sins of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh, all your thinking and meditating on Jesus is useless. But if all you're doing is seeking to mortify the deeds of the flesh and you have no hope and no trust in Christ, then all you are is a legalist. These are both. It's just a general and between these two things. It's both. Put on and make no room. Make no place. Leave no door open. May God help us. In the battle, parents, my last exhortation is to you. I've had to be subtle. I hope I've accomplished that while still seeking to be direct. Parents, we must be fathers and mothers who are honest with our children, especially as they are becoming young men and young women, and explain these things to them unashamedly, clearly, biblically, and explicitly, as is appropriate for their age. I can't do that from this pulpit. It would be unseemly. If you don't do it in your home, it is unseemly. You do not love your children. If you are not consciously doing this with them, and then monitor them carefully and lovingly. You need help in doing that? Go get the Westminster, Westminster Larger Catechism, questions 138 and 139, and read them, and read them, and study them with your family. Let's pray. Father, be merciful to us. that We might fulfill our roles as those who are called, those who are chosen, those for whom Christ died, and those who are filled with the Spirit. Deliver those who are yet in bonds and keep each one of us by your grace. Oh God, if you are at this point in time an avenger toward anyone in this place, come in grace to their hearts that they might repent of their sins. They might look to you for forgiveness and cleansing and power and grace to turn from their sins and follow after you. Hear our prayers, O oh God. We need your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.